Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Path Forward uh, put on by the U.S. Chambers Foundation. We're glad that you have joined us today for a really special program with the nation's Surgeon General. We are delighted to welcome the nation's doctor, Dr. Jerome Adams, who oversees the operations of more than six thousand uniformed health officers in more than 800 locations worldwide. He has been one of our nation's leading voices during this pandemic, but his work is not just focused there. He has created some really important initiatives, and we've worked with him before on one of them, which is the pressing opioid epidemic in this country. He's also created initiatives around the link between community health and economic prosperity and national security, certainly a core belief at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The challenges our nation and the world have been facing with COVID-19, we know they cannot be solved alone. So his motto, better health through better partnerships, is certainly something we all need to be striving toward. We need strong partnerships. We need close alliances and collaboration between the public and private sectors to get our nation back to health and to get America back to work. So Dr. Adams, let's get right to it. Can you tell our audience the state of COVID in the United States today and what you see coming in the next few months? Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you to everyone for joining. And uh, it's a great place to start because I want people to understand the virus itself hasn't changed a lot, but our understanding of it has changed tremendously. If you think about uh, uh, our history in this country, the times of greatest innovation, particularly in uh, the medical field and scientific fields, have been during and after times of war, whether that's the Civil War, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the First World War, or the Second World War. And we've seen uh, more advances in the last eight months than we've seen in the last decade in this country. We know much more about who is at risk and why, and uh, that's resulted in us being able to better protect the vulnerable uh, and drive down our mortality rates, significantly lower mortality rates among people who are diagnosed with the virus and shorter hospital stays. Now we know much more about how to treat those who do come into the hospital with drugs like remdesivir, steroids, new ventilatory strategies. Uh, we know what works to keep communities safe. And uh, my office has launched an aggressive campaign called COVID Stops With Me. And I'd encourage you to go to my uh, Twitter site at surgeon underscore general and see the video I shared because really the tools to stop this virus are already in our communities. Look at New York City. They've gone from worst in the world to uh, a less than 1% positivity rate for several weeks uh, ongoing. And so it proves we don't need to wait until we get a vaccine or some miracle drug to get this virus under control. We can do it right now. And what I, I really especially um, think is important is that we've we come uh, really face-to-face uh, -face with the terrible inequities that exist in our country. Uh, we're in the midst of a major social justice movement, but I remind people that you can't have social justice if you don't have health equity. And uh, this virus has laid bare many of the underlying inequities that have existed in our society. Five times hospitalization rates for, uh, for Hispanic Americans, for African Americans, for uh, Latinx, uh, and, uh, and Black and African Americans and, uh, and our tribal brothers and sisters. And so I think it's very important that, uh, that we understand we have to address these social conditions that then lead to the medical conditions that create these terrible health inequities. But uh, very quickly, there is good, uh, much good news out there too. We are just past 100 million tests. Uh, we have a 30 day supply of PPE in every state, at least uh, that's what the governors are telling us. Uh, we have seen cases and hospitalizations and deaths go down continually over the last several weeks. We uh, appear to have gotten over the summer hump. Uh, what we're now worried about is a post Labor Day and headed into flu season uh, resurgence that could possibly happen and we need your help for that. And uh, yes, what I see on the horizon. Well, um, I talked to Tony Fauci uh, regularly. Uh, I trust him, and he still believes we will have a vaccine that is safe and effective by the end of this year. <clears throat> and so uh, I think it's important for us all to be thinking about vaccines, and I know we're going to hopefully have a little bit uh, of conversation on that in, in the future. But uh, I also uh, hope we can continue to drive down cases, hospitalizations, and deaths 
through basic public health measures. And that combined with the herd immunity we will increasingly get from a vaccine, plus a commitment to protecting the vulnerable, I think will allow us to open more places and to keep them open. It's not that we need to stay shut down. It's that we all need to understand the measures that we have to take in order to open and to stay open. And so uh, just uh, overall, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, that uh, with what we've learned about the virus, with the uh, the resources we have in place, and with the uh, the the prospect of a vaccine on the horizon, plus drugs like remdesivir, convalescent plasma, um, already available, that we're getting a handle on this virus. But what we need is really the will of people to come together and and actually do the things that we have learned are effective. Do you think that's the biggest challenge at this phase right now as we go through different phases of this pandemic is getting people to have the will to stick with it this long, the biggest challenge we're facing? Well, absolutely. Uh, One of the things that I've said to the Chamber of Commerce before is that people do not prioritize health. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean when you look at Gallup polls, when you look at what motivates behaviors, uh, the number one issue people vote on is jobs and the economy. And it's why I have consistently tried to help everyone understand that when we promote health, we promote a healthy economy. But far too often, health is pitted against the economy. And you saw it with, you're seeing it with COVID. You've got people in the reopening camp and you've got people in the pro-public health camp and they are constantly at odds with each other or or framed as being at odds with, with each other in the media. And what I'm trying to help people understand is this can be a virtuous upward cycle or a vicious downward cycle. Uh, If you're in the public health camp, you have to know that uh, that for every 1% increase in unemployment, you have a 1.3% increase in people who try to take their lives by suicide. Uh, We know that that we are delaying diagnosis of cancer, of uh, of diabetes, 4.2 million children behind on their vaccinations, all because of the shutdown. There are real health harms and economic harms uh, from shutting down. So the health people can't forget about the impacts on the economy, but the people who uh, care about the economy need to understand that we can't reopen and stay open as long as we have uncontrolled viral spread. And so we truly are all in this together and we all need to have the will to work together. But the other element to this, uh, the elephant in the room, is that we have a once in a century pandemic. Uh, That would be hard in in and of itself. But there is no chapter in the pandemic playbook for an impeachment trial. And I know it seems like forever ago, but remember, when we first were learning about this pandemic, we literally had our country at each other's throats in an impeachment trial. There's no chapter in the pandemic playbook for a presidential election, a highly divisive presidential election. And there's no chapter in the pandemic playbook for a social justice movement, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 60s. And so it makes it hard to have these conversations because I say one thing, but you may hear it completely differently depending on what your priorities are and what is most important to you. And it's not to say that any of these things that I'm talking about are unimportant, but it makes it very difficult to have that conversation and to have and for people to have the will to work together. I think that's such an important point. And one of the reasons uh, your friend, Dr. Fauci and others and you, I think, have been willing to come on and talk to our audiences is getting good information out there, giving people confidence and leadership has been really important and letting people have access to leaders directly. And so one of the things we did when people were registering for this program is they could submit a pressing question. And I'm going to roll one now. This is from Kelly Kowalsik in Michigan. Hi, my name is Kelly Kowalczak. I'm from Gordon Food Service in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Do we have any known instances of people getting COVID-19 more than once? Do we know if the virus will mutate like other virus strains? At what point would we say that as a society, we are safe again to resume our normal lives without wearing masks and social distancing? So Kelly, fantastic questions. Uh, Do we know if people have gotten this virus more than once? The answer is yes, but extremely rarely. And uh, the broader answer for that question is that we're still learning every day about what this virus is and does and how it behaves. So uh, anyone who tells you anything definitively about this virus 
uh, is is likely set up to uh, to have egg on their face in the future. Tony Fauci is the top virologist in the world, and he tells me he's never seen a virus like this in all of his 40 years. So important to know what we know right now, uh, and that's the I frame it that way purposefully, is that you can get this virus more than once, but it is extremely rare. And our belief as health officials is that once you get this virus, you will have uh, immunity for a certain period of time. We don't know how long that is. Uh, CDC has said it could be as little as three months. Um, and it may just be like the seasonal flu, where every year we have to get revaccinated against a new strain. Uh, all viruses mutate. This virus hasn't mutated in such a way that we think it's becoming particularly more virulent or that we're worried that the vaccine that we're developing right now won't work. So that's important to know too, that we haven't seen major mutations in this virus to this point, but we still don't know yet. As far as wearing uh, masks, uh, social distancing, and when we get back to normal, well, what's interesting is in some ways, uh, I think we need to prepare for for a new normal. And I know some people don't like that terminology, um, but the fact is when you look at the Southern hemisphere of this country, they've had a particularly mild flu season. That's a blessing, that's great. Why is that? Well, we think it's because people are finally doing what we've been telling them to do for decades to protect themselves from the flu, but they're doing it because of COVID. So uh, in some ways we probably should be thinking uh, more intentionally about screening people when they come into buildings during the flu season for symptoms, encouraging people to stay home, uh, telling people to wear a mask uh, during flu season if they think that they are sick or may have been exposed to someone. And so as far as the, the wide mask wearing, that will end when we get uh, to a degree of herd immunity from the vaccine uh, that, uh, that allows us to stop transmission of this virus, but that may only be for a season. Uh, but again, I think it's important to, to really look at some of the benefits of, of uh, the things that we're doing right now. Uh, hand sanitizer uh, everywhere, more readily available. Uh, some of these things we don't want to go back to the old normal because guess what? It cost every county across this country $2 million per year in lost productivity uh, and, and other expenses due to the flu. Uh, as, as employers, the flu costs you a lot of money. And so uh, I think it's a, a very uh, smart business decision to look at, okay, can we continue some of these things moving forward uh, to limit the spread of not just COVID, but flu and protect uh, our, our people and in turn our, uh, our ability to continue up and running when, uh, when we're facing some of these, these threats moving forward. You know, it's so interesting to hear you talk about uh, the community impact of something like the flu, because it relates directly to something that you care deeply about, the Chamber and the Chamber Foundation care deeply about, which is this link between economic prosperity, between employment and health outcomes, right? They're not separate things. You know, one, it's, it's a, it can be a positive ecosystem or a negative ecosystem, depending. Um, and so this priority you've had on community health and economic prosperity how both how has the pandemic influenced that? And as I understand it, you have a new report coming out soon. Can you give us a little sneak peek? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, my report on community health and economic prosperity has been in the works for uh, several years before this pandemic. Uh, and even before the coronavirus pandemic, we knew the health of Americans wasn't as good as it could be and was worse than the health of people in other wealthy nations even as we pay more for healthcare than any other nation in the world. You all know as employers that healthcare for most businesses is your number two expense. And, and so we call this the US health disadvantage. The fact that we pay more and get less uh, for what we're paying than any other country. And America's poor health status is, uh, inflicts costs on people, families, businesses, and on society. Uh, COVID-19 has exposed additional cost of the U.S. health disadvantage as the virus has claimed more lives among those with certain underlying conditions, and it's disrupted our economy significantly to the extent that even access to health care coverage was diminished in a country uh, where we uniquely provide a significant proportion of our uh, health care coverage through employers. 
Millions of people lost employer-sponsored health insurance. Uh, the U.S. health disadvantage increases health care costs, but it also lowers productivity and competitiveness and compromises business success and growth. And so uh, what I want people to understand is that if businesses allow themselves to continue to be pitted against health or uh, say that it's not my business to get into the business of promoting community health, then we're not going to just see individual health suffer. We're going to see uh, business bottom line suffer. And the Business Roundtable talked about this uh, a year ago when they uh, changed their focus from shareholder return to looking at stakeholder return. Well, guess what? COVID again has laid this bare. <clears throat> when you look at stakeholders, if you don't have healthy supply chains, if you don't have consumers who actually can go out and buy your products, if you don't have a workforce who can come in and actually do the job, uh, all these are part of you being successful as businesses. And so my Community Health and Economic Prosperity Report really helps businesses understand how the health of the community impacts their business bottom line, but it also gives examples of companies that are finding unique ways to contribute to community health. Uh, Belden is a company in Richmond, Indiana, for instance, that uh, found that they were having to interview dozens and some, in some cases hundreds of people to fill a job because not enough people could pass the drug screen. So instead of going interview, interview, um, uh, yeah, you get the job, you fail the drug screen and we start all over again, they screen people up front. And if people uh, fail the drug screen, they've connected them with community um, organizations that can get them into treatment and recovery. And if they're successful in treatment and recovery, then they, are, uh, they, they, they save a job for them. And they found that the employees who complete this program actually miss less work than people who don't have a substance use disorder. Uh, wow. Another, uh, another uh, 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 example is Grayston Bakery in, um, in New York. Grayston, uh, up to 70% of their employees, about 70% are people who are uh, formerly incarcerated. Uh, they've uh, put a social worker on site to help these individuals develop life skills. And again, they found that their uh, absenteeism and their turnover rate is lower than what other comparable companies are. And that is more than paid for the social workers and the life skills coaching that they're providing on site. So again, thinking outside the box, uh, but recognizing that the health of the community and the health of individuals in the community ultimately impacts your healthy bottom line. Right. And I think in the other way, too, right, that a healthy business community impacts families and individuals health in a good way, too, you know, that it is they all relate to each other. Right. Exactly. It, it can be a virtuous upward cycle or as we see, we've seen with the opioid epidemic in many places, uh, the poor health of the community leads to businesses not being successful and leaving. And that causes, again, the health to continue to go down because people uh, the num one of the number one predictors of whether or not you're going to be successful in recovery, for instance, is whether or not you have a, uh, a job, a meaningful job that pays a decent wage. So you all are essential to the health of communities, and we need to recognize that interconnectedness and stop allowing ourselves to be pitted against one another. It's so interesting. The same thing is true with uh, jail time and prison time and recidivism rates. You know, employment numbers drastically reduce recidiv recidivism, right? If people get a job, that's what works. Um, going back to, well, we're on the private sector for a second, um, not to focus on a personal passion, but while we're on the private sector for a second, whenever we talk about the pandemic, when the country has a conversation about the pandemic response, it's quick to go to what the government is doing. But the private sector is also playing a pretty big role in getting us through this pandemic and getting America healthy again. Can you talk for a second about that? Well, absolutely. And um, one of the things <clears throat> that has been interesting and I think needs to be one of the lessons learned from this pandemic, is that by design, by intention, by the request of many of you all on this call, uh, the government has uh, really decreased regulations and put a lot of our uh, capacity for innovation <clears throat> and response at the local community level. And I believe personally, and so do, all, so do most of you, that uh, things are best handled at the local level, and uh, things uh, become very difficult when you try to manage a local response from Washington, D.C. 
So uh, one of the lessons learned is that uh, we need to do a better job of empowering and enabling and being able to quickly unleash uh, local innovation and local capacity. I was at a company in San Diego just yesterday called Helix. Helix is a, is a company that was stood up to, uh, to do a, a different type of genomic sequencing, but they were able to uh, shift over what they did uh, to be able to do COVID testing. And they now have the capability of doing almost 100,000 COVID tests a day. That allowed the local community to be able to uh, respond in a way that is much more agile uh, and uh, their turnaround times are under 24 hours than simply saying, we're gonna do a COVID test and we're going to courier it to the airport and we're gonna fly it to the CDC in Atlanta and we're gonna have them run the test and then send the test results back. So it's just one example of uh, how really local businesses can innovate and help the community, which in turn allows the community to be able to, uh, to reopen. Uh, there are many other ways. And again, I would encourage you to keep your eyes and ears open for my community health and economic prosperity report for businesses to lean into community health, whether it's promoting smoke-free air policies. Uh, many of you give people either uh, benefits or penalties if they uh, don't smoke or smoke on their insurance. But guess what? Uh, making sure they live in a smoke-free apartment is going to do more to prevent them from smoking and help your, your healthcare cost than giving them $25 off on their deductible. We know diabetes is a major expense for employers. Well, guess what? If you don't even know that most of your employees live in communities where uh, they can't easily get to a grocery store and get fresh fruits and vegetables, or they live in a place where they can't go out and exercise, then uh, all of the uh, on-site interventions that, that you're putting in place are going to have less of an impact than what they could when people go home and then are in an environment where they can't make a healthy choice. The choices people make are 100% dependent on the choices people have around them. And it is your business to understand and to, uh, have it, and to try to impact the choices that people have around them. Well, you're going to have to come back and tell us more about the report. We're not going to we're not going to let you off the hook. You're going to have to come back and talk to us about that. I know particularly the, the chambers across the country would love to hear more about it. Um, you know what I, I wish we had time to delve into is I think sometimes people hear uh, streamlining regulation and worry that it's code for not regulating and not overseeing. And I think that's not true. In fact, some of what we're seeing from the government in terms of streamlined regulations are actually, I think, more potent and more powerful uh, oversight than we had before. But that's another show too. We <laughs> have um, one of our registrants had a question that's exactly on this topic about public health and business. So let's roll Emily Yu from Washington, D.C.'s tape. Hi, my name is Emily Yu. I'm with the De Beaumont Foundation in the DC metro area. And my question today is, given the opportunity we have, and some would even say the necessity to really reframe how we think about public health moving forward, how can businesses in the country today help rethink public-private partnerships moving forward for better community health for all? Emily, that is a fantastic question. And I really, uh, I'm a big, a big proponent of these partnerships. My motto is better health through better partnerships, because as I said earlier, I believe uh, health is local uh, and that, that things work best when we leverage the, uh, the innovation, uh, the passion of the local community and our private partners. And so one of the things we're trying to do from a federal level is, uh, is make it possible for people to work with other partners. And so uh, an example is, a, is that this administration has approved a record number of Medicaid waivers, which gives states the flexibility to be able to work in health endeavors with partners that they haven't before. I would encourage you to also reach out to the faith-based communities and law enforcement communities, because unfortunately, the law enforcement community uh, are our number one mental health providers in this country. That's not the way it should be, but it's the way it is. And so uh, they, in many cases, have visibility and insight on problems and an opportunity to intervene uh, that, uh, that others may not. And again, the faith communities out there are on the front lines constantly. They're the ones that are providing the food banks that, uh, that, that are uh, helping your employees, in many cases, be able to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. And so 
I, I think that, uh, again, one of the lessons we need to take out of this is that we can't solve all the problems from Washington, D.C. or from the state capitol, uh, but that we really need to, uh, to, to focus on uh, and to leverage those public-private partnerships. Amen to that. Um, let's roll another audience question. This one is from Ted Heckman in Ohio. Hi, I'm Ted Heckman with Cincinnati Bell, located in Cincinnati, Ohio. We have recently seen the media that the CDC is advising states to gear up for vaccine distribution by November. Are we really that close to a vaccine or vaccines? And is it realistic to think states have the needed resources to accomplish the ramp up and implementation? Ted, fantastic question. Uh, so the uh, CEO of Pfizer has said that they expect a signal um, by by uh, late November, late late October, in terms of a vaccine. So what does that mean? I want people to understand that we aren't compromising on safety here by any means. The the safety processes and signals will be as strong uh, as for any vaccine. And uh, honestly, when you talk to health experts, <clears throat> uh, they will tell you this will be the most va scrutinized vaccine of all time. And it is very likely that we will have a stronger safety and efficacy signal at the time of vaccine approval than we've had for any other vaccine at the point of approval. Why is that? Well, uh, number one, FDA says you need to have 3,000 people minimum in a safety trial. Each of the trials has 30,000 people in it. Uh, number two, we still unfortunately have a fair amount of background community spread. And so when we're looking at, at safety and efficacy, what we're looking at is to get to a certain number of events, either events where uh, person A who got the vaccine didn't get sick, but person B who didn't get the vaccine did get sick, or a certain number of uh, issues that make us feel safe that, okay, um, a thousand people have gotten this vaccine and we haven't had any adverse side effects. So, uh, so we feel pretty good about it. Uh, again, the large number of people in the trial and the background community transmission rates or why we think we will get a signal by October. Important to know that there are independent boards, institutional review boards, data safety monitoring boards that will determine whether or not this study is unblinded. So we in the government actually don't have the ability to uh, intervene until an independent board has said that this drug is safe and effective. Uh, so I want everyone to understand that because there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about uh, the government and their ability to inter to interfere in the process, but an independent board has to say it's safe and effective. Now, all that said, uh, we actually do believe some of these trials will start to uh, have results and positive signals by October, but this will be the most logistically difficult vaccine ever to distribute. Why? Because you may have two or three different vaccines from different companies. Some are one dose, some are two doses. And we're going to try to ramp it up as quickly as possible. So uh, it would be shame on us if we didn't tell pl places to prepare. And that's why we're telling states, start preparing now for vaccine distribution. Uh, they aren't going to have to do it alone. Operation Warp Speed is spending literally billions of dollars to not just stand up a vaccine, but to make sure the infrastructure is in place to appropriately distribute it. And it will be difficult, but it's a challenge that uh, we must meet and we must meet it. Uh, again, by federal support, by state support, and even by uh, businesses really uh, thinking about how they can how they can help in the distribution process on a local level. Can you estimate, if there are 330 million Americans, how long it takes to get everybody vaccinated? Uh, that's another great question. And the most honest answer I can give you is anyone who would speculate is truly just speculating. <laughs> uh, and we don't know which vaccine is going to get across the finish line first. And so if it's a one dose vaccine, then it's going to be a whole lot easier to get people vaccinated than if it's a two dose vaccine. And so that's just one variable that, uh, that comes to play. But I want you to know that our strategy actually is going to be to uh, vaccinate the vulnerable and frontline workers first, because we feel that that's going to have the biggest impact. So really, it's not uh, our... Uh, so much about getting everyone vaccinated as it is getting the most vulnerable vac uh, vaccinated 
and the people who are most likely to encounter disease or spread disease vaccinated so that we can break transmission. And uh, I feel pretty good that uh, we can start getting vaccines in people uh, again by end of this year, early next year. And if we use that strategy, uh, protecting the vulnerable and frontline workers first, then we will see an impact uh, from this in short order. And I hope by, uh, by, early, by early next year. You know, I think you said something really important. We've said a lot of important things, but you said one thing a minute ago about how business can help with the distribution and the supply chain issues. And you know we're with you and and working in a number of different ways to prepare for that. But as you look at this audience that includes state and local chambers across the country and businesses across the country, what can they do to help get this anti-vaxxer message tapered down. So what would you say to community leaders about how they can help to make sure that there's no misstep when the vaccine's available? Great question. So glad you asked that. Important for us to first understand that uh, uh, there's, when we hear about anti-vax movements, uh, 90 plus percent of parents get their kids vaccinated. 90 plus percent. So you're really talking about 10 percent of people. And when you dig into that 10 percent, there's really only one to 2% who are really resistant, uh, what I call vaccine resistant. The rest are either vaccine hesitant or have trouble accessing vaccines. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's important for us to know that the majority of people actually are doing the right thing or wanna do the right thing or will do the right thing in terms of getting vaccinated. Uh, but the, the, the folks we call anti-vaxxers or I call a vaccine resistant are really just a loud minority we need to be careful about giving them too much uh, airplay uh, and, and, and uh, leading more people to believe that, uh, <clears throat> that there's reason to be concerned. That's number one. But what can businesses do? Well, you can help people understand the impact that this has on your bottom line. And again, a, a COVID situation lays this bare. The quicker we get people vaccinated, the quicker you all can reopen your businesses and bring people back to work. Uh, there is a direct correlation there. Uh, the same is the true is true for flu. Uh, one person with the flu can take out an entire division of your uh, company, and uh, and so important that we understand that. Important that you uh, uh, really and COVID brought this to bear. But uh, some of you've done a good job of this with flu. Some of you not so much. And we understand that when one person comes in sick, they can infect uh, every uh, many other people. And so we need to come up with policies that allow people and encourage them to stay at home, whether it's working from home or having time off, if they have a cold, uh, a fever, uh, a cough, a sniffle, because uh, again, that's not just about that person, that's about your bottom line. And this flu season is gonna be the most important flu season we've had in decades. Uh, we don't wanna have a double whammy of flu on top of COVID because that can really overwhelm our healthcare system capacity. Uh, but also we need to understand that number one, the biggest predictor of who's going to get the COVID vaccine is going to be, I think, who gets the flu vaccine. So it's an opportunity to prime the pump and have that conversation, which, again, will then determine how quickly you all can reopen. Uh, I think that's important, but also important to know that the flu symptoms are same, the same as COVID symptoms. So if someone comes into your workplace and you have a screen set up and they screen positive, uh, you're going to have to either send them home and, and potentially shut down anyone or anywhere they've been in contact with for fear of COVID. So every flu um, positive that is a COVID false alarm uh, has the potential to disrupt your workplace. So uh, you can make sure people get flu, flu vaccines available at work. You can um, work with your health departments to bring, in, to bring in mobile vans. You can give people time off to get flu vaccines. You can put up signs encouraging people to get flu vaccines. And uh, I know that some people are resistant to this idea, but uh, you have the ability as employers, depending on the industry you're in uh, and, you're, and, and where, you, where you're located to say you need to get a flu vaccine unless you have a doctor's note saying why you can't get it or you can't come to work. And people will accept that from their employer in a way that they won't accept it from their uh, government. And so all these are things that you should think about in terms of promoting vaccinations and, uh, and then sending people to trusted resources like the CDC because there's just a lot of misinformation out there. So we only have a few more minutes and I have, well, approximately 112 questions still to ask you. So let's try to do a little bit of a lightning round here. We'll do some speed round here. 
Speed round. I want to shift topics a little bit to uh, what you and I discussed the last time we were together, which was this opioid ec epidemic. And I know it's been a great concern of yours uh, and a great focus of yours. Um, now we're seeing evidence that overdose overdose deaths are rising, suicide rates, as you men mentioned a minute ago, are rising. Um, you know, kind of what do you make of this trend? And what is it that we can be doing as a society to stem that tragedy? Well, even before COVID, we saw that life expectancy had been trending down for several years in a row. And we knew that in many cases, this was due to diseases of despair, depression, anxiety, substance misuse. Um, suicide. And so it's important that you all understand as employers that you can't be healthy from here down if you're not healthy from here up. You need to look at your coverage for mental health services and substance use disorder in particular, because it actually is an investment that pays dividends. And if you don't uh, fund those, those, uh, those benefits, then it's going to hurt your bottom line. You need to look at uh, destigmatizing substance use disorder. Stigma kills more people than cigarettes or heroin or any other or in any other issue out there. So stigma kills more people than COVID. We need to destigmatize substance use disorder so that people feel comfortable uh, seeking help. And you can do that by sharing stories, but also by being willing to hire people who are in recovery. And then I put out a Surgeon General's advisory on the lock zone. Learn about it. Be willing to carry it because 70 percent of overdoses in, some, in many counties I've been to are by people who have who are employed. So we like to think of substance use disorder as some homeless person uh, who's detached from society in a back alley. But actually, most of the people who are misusing opioids are your employees right now. So uh, they could overdose on site. Uh, they could overdose in other places. Make sure you know about and encourage people to carry naloxone and that you don't uh, become the source of stigma that prevents people from asking for help. I think that's a great answer. And I think you've said so many important things today uh, and cleared up a lot of myths, right? The reason that advice on masks and quarantining changes is that we're getting smarter about the disease. The reason that treatments change and mortality rates go down is that we get a moment to get smarter about the disease. A reason to encourage flu shots, in addition to all the ones we've ever heard, uh, that we've already heard, is that it helps people uh, reduce the myth of of why they might not want vaccines, right? And so you've said a lot of important things here today, and I wanna give you an opportunity to address one last question here to the audience before we go, and it's this. As the nation's doctor, if you could look into the camera and tell this audience your advice on keeping up with routine screenings, routine testings, routine physicals, treatments for chronic conditions um, versus being afraid that if they go to the dentist, go to get a mammogram, go to their doctor, they're putting themselves at risk of COVID. So as the nation's doctor, what should we be doing about our, our routine health issues? Well, it's critically important that people understand that it is safe, that uh, healthcare facilities have, have ample practices in place to bring you in safely for screenings, for preventative services, and if you have any concerns. Uh, we've also substantially increased the availability of telehealth services. Uh, and so many of the uh, visits are happening in that manner to make them even safer. But personal story, my wife actually is starting treatment for cancer next week. Uh, she was due to go in and get a PET scan earlier this year, uh, right in the midst of the COVID pandemic when we were shut down. Her diagnosis was delayed several months because of the COVID pandemic. So I can tell you very personally, uh, there are real health harms to people not coming forward and getting screened, whether it's for colonoscopies and you look at uh, Chadwick Boseman uh, dying early from, uh, from colon cancer or uh, vaccine preventable diseases, 4 million children behind on their vaccinations or an array of other diseases uh, that, that again, could be caught early, but will be delayed. So as employers and as individuals, I encourage you to uh, get screened yourself and to encourage others out there to get their physical, uh, get their children's vaccinations. Make an appointment today uh, because unfortunately, what, what I fear is that we will in the long run see that many more people uh, are, are harmed from a health perspective and, uh, and may even die from diseases other than COVID 
that got missed during the shutdowns than people who actually passed from COVID. And that's not to compare one versus the other because you never wanna compare one tragedy to another tragedy, but it would be a real tragedy if we could prevent many of these deaths from occurring and that doesn't actually happen. And speaking of prevention, uh, I wanna finish with my three W's. Uh, very important to understand that again, Italy, Spain, Wuhan, uh, uh, New York City, uh, even Arizona, some of the worst places in the world at some point for transmission of COVID uh, are now uh, some of the best places in the world and are reopening. And they did it without a vaccine. They did it with the three W's, wash your hands, wear a mask and watch your distance, meaning avoid crowded indoor spaces and, uh, and stay six feet from others. If we do these three things, uh, and they're not hard things to do, we can drive down viral transmission. We can uh, successfully uh, and in a sustainable fashion reopen. And then when we uh, stack a vaccine on top of that uh, later this year, then we can really drive this virus into the ground and get back to some sense of normal in the future. Again, a new normal, hopefully a better normal where we uh, recognize that we need to address inequities in communities, uh, where we uh, embrace public health practices that will help us prevent not just COVID and flu, and where we truly do realize that we are all stronger together. And so uh, I just wanna say thank you and I really look forward to working with you all in the future as we've worked together in the past, because uh, as Surgeon General, and people think it's crazy that I've spoken to business communities so much, I go around speaking to local chambers of commerce as often as health departments, but I really do believe you all are critical to the nation's health. And I believe the nation's health is critical to what you care about and what you do each and every day. So let's do this together. We couldn't agree more, Dr. Adams. It's always a delight to see you. Please come back and talk to us about your report and how we can help spread the news. And thank you for your service. Absolutely. Get your flu vaccine. I have. I have. And I wear my mask. I'm all three of the W's. I might be a couple more W's. Uh, <laughs> we're going to fly the W flag here is what we're going to do. So wonderful. thank you so much again. And to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. If you've missed any prior episodes, you can find them at uschamberfoundation.org or on YouTube. Uh, we'll be back with you in three weeks. In the meantime, you heard about the three W's. Please stay safe and take care of yourselves and one another. Thank you again.